that you are my fortress you are my portion you are my hiding place i believe you are the way the truth the life i believe you are the way the truth Set on you, and you meet me here today. Mercies that are new, all my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long. When I am here with you, it's a new horizon. I'm set on. again the way the way the truth the life I believe you are the way the truth the life I believe you are you believe that this morning church he is the way. He's the truth. Amen. He is the life. Hey, church, so we got a, uh, I was working on a new song this week as I was reading today's text in Acts chapter 3 about the, the man that Peter and John, when they were walking on the way to the temple, right, they saw the man who was begging and his eyes were down and his hands were held out asking for alms, right? And Peter says, I don't have any gold. I don't have any silver. But what I do have is, is Jesus, right? That's a paraphrased version. Don't quote me. But I wrote this song. It's called Running. And I pray that it blesses you. Yeah. 
Jesus Christ, one and only. Leave behind your regrets and 
mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling, yes God Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling, yeah Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ
thank you, Lord, that you would be glorified in this place, God, that you would be high and lifted up in this place, Lord Jesus, and that our hearts, God, would, would cry out to you, Lord, from our chairs, God, as your word is open and our eyes are fixed upon you, Lord Jesus, that our hearts would leap out and grab for you, Lord. And we call for your spirit, Lord Jesus, to come and dwell with us, Lord God. We need you. If you don't move, God, every single thing that we do here is useless. But we know, God, that your people are gathered here, Lord, people who are called by your name, sons and daughters of the living King Jesus. And we know, God, that where we are, Lord God, in your name, you are there with us. We love you. We praise you. We want to honor you at this time. Be glorified, Lord. It's in your name. Amen. 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 Awesome. <laughs> it's easy to come up, or should I say it's easier to come up and teach and preach God's word after God's people have been worshiping. Hearts are prepared, and, and you just know it. The Spirit of God just, you just know it. You just know when you're ready. How many of you like the feeling of not being prepared? I can't stand that feeling, right? Or being ready for what's next. Worship has a way of doing just that. It calms your heart and prepares you with pure faith and confidence. You know, you know I'm ready. I'm ready to hear what God has to say for each one of us today. We are in Acts chapter 3. We're going to go ahead and tackle just the first 12 verses because one, there's so much there. And two, the second portion of this chapter has a lot to do with prophecy next week. And so we're going to be talking a lot about that in Peter's sermon. Yes, this healing of this lame man who was begging for alms, the healing of him gives another opportunity, another open door for Peter the preacher, to preach again, to preach again. And what's interesting, like with his sermon earlier in chapter 2, it's happening around the Temple Mount. Very interesting. So, this morning's sermon title is, A Certain Man Meets a Certain God. He meets a certain God. Now, you know, you might say, well, I've never met God. I've never met God, not the way that I know Michael. I've met, I know Michael. I've met God. I met Michael today, right? Or I, you know, no. But God has met you. You know. If you know, you know. And this man, he met God this day. A certain man. Now, the idea behind a certain man, it speaks of a kind of man could speak of every man, or at least some men, men and women. You see, the idea here is that this is a man we should be able to relate to. Sometimes you can pass through the passage and forget to see just, well, how do I relate in some way to this man who is lame, unable to walk? This certain man, he's no child, the scripture will tell us. He's over 40 years of age. This certain man has been lame or disabled his entire life. This certain man is at the mercy of those who bring him to the gate of the temple each day. He's at the mercy of somebody else. This certain man's occupation is beggar. And there is nothing he can do about his situation. That's how everyone is before they come to Christ. Every one of us, this is a certain man because every one of us should be able to relate to this man. Every single one of us. From our mother's womb, we have been unable to walk with God because of sin. Sin separates us from God. We are spiritually lame like this man. Disabled spiritually. Until Christ comes and raises us up and gives our feet strength. Again, he was at the mercy, we'll see this morning, 
He was at the mercy of others to bring him to the temple gate where he can beg at the mercy of others. You know, before you come to faith in Jesus, you are at the mercy of everybody else. Whether you admit it or not, deep inside you know it. Your life seems to be controlled by everything and everybody else but God. And your occupation, no matter how rich you are, you're a beggar. No matter how much, how many, how much possessions you possess, you're a beggar. Spiritually speaking, your pockets are empty. And you're finding and looking for finding someone to meet that spiritual need. This man's a beggar. He's in a situation. He can't do anything about it. We should be able to relate to this man. What kind of advice would you give this man this morning before we read this passage? Think about that. What kind of advice today? If you ran into a situation like this, what would be your advice to this man? Would you encourage him to find some state assistance or welfare program? Or would you see a spiritual need? The church has lost their sight. You're looking for gold and for silver, for someone else to help the man instead of you. Peter and John, they stopped. And they took care of the situation. And they saw the greatest need was this man's spiritual need. It really was. Maybe you would be the one that would partner with those that are bringing this man to the temple gate each day. Tell you what, I'll, I'll take a load off of you. I, I'll bring this man, this lame man, to the gate this week. I'll, I'll do my share. I'll do my good deeds. Again, Peter and John saw a desperate man in a desperate situation. And they had nothing physical in the tangible to help this man they had no worthy advice that this man hadn't heard before, apart from God. Church, apart from God. Whether you are a beggar this morning or a brother who wants to help, faith in the name of Jesus Christ is your only hope your only power for healing and freedom, period. Whether you're a beggar or a brother that wants to help. Let's read our passage this morning. Acts chapter three, verse one. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. So he's asking for alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, that is Peter, Peter turns to him with John, and Peter says, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Oh, listen. He's thinking, I'm going to, all right, these guys are going to really fill my cup of mercy. And then Peter said, these discouraging words, <laughs> silver and gold I don't have. And the man's countenance went, boo. Silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Arise and walk. And he, that is Peter, took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God, just as Trevor's song proclaimed. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew that it was 
Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the gate, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Ah, here we go, preacher Peter. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Now he's going to go right into his sermon. At that. Like in Acts chapter 2, he explains the situation and then he gives an exhortation to the situation. His explanation <laughs> is where our passage ends this morning. As they're amazed, they're, they're, you know, their jaw drops and, and they do what men and women, humans have a tendency to do. We look to the person who just did this miracle as whoa, you know? The way that somebody would hit a three pointer, you know? <sighs> oh. You see what that guy just did? He healed that guy. Did you see what that guy did? He just healed that guy. But Peter, in his humility, he gives, he gives the, the reason. He says, look, it wasn't us, it was Jesus. And let me tell you something before we start in this passage. He just didn't say any Jesus because the name Jesus was common. When he said Jesus Christ of Nazareth, everyone in that temple within an ear here knew who he was talking about. When you speak the name of Jesus, do they know who you're talking about? They may not understand the power, but do they know the Jesus you're talking about? Now, jumping back up here, looking at verses 1. Now, Peter, verses, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, when Peter and John, <laughs> I love this, went up together, they're heading to the temple. Listen, I, I want to focus just a second on this relationship between these two guys. As I look at their kind of their makeup and their characters, I, I can see some common, common things about these two guys. But, but John's is a good bit younger than Peter. And if I was John's dad or a relative or a crazy uncle, I'd be saying, hey, hey, stay away from that Peter guy. <laughs> you, you sure you want Peter as a mentor? You know, you want to, you know, but, but these two, there's something special about these two, isn't there? And they're together, going up to the temple to pray. But backing up, Luke 22, 8 tells us that Jesus told Peter and John to go prepare the Passover that final night for that upper room. Jesus looked at them and saw a relationship there. Something powerful, something they were, something special together. Who's that person in your life that Jesus has put into your life like Peter and John? Go prepare the Passover, you two knuckleheads. And then in John 13, 23 and 24, it tells us, John tells us that, that uh, in, up there in that upper room, these two were trying to get Jesus' attention. Peter's motioning to John. John, ask him who it is that's going to betray him. <laughs> As John's leaning on the breast of Jesus, these two are trying to figure things out. They're working together in that upper room when Jesus said, one of you is, a, is my enemy. One's going to betray me. It's John 18, 15, where John tells us that this Peter and John followed Jesus on the night of his arrest to the high priest's home. John had access to the court, and John got Peter in. John was there, right there. The scripture tells us that when Peter denied the Lord that he, I don't know the guy, three times, I told you I don't know him, to a little girl. Yeah, that wasn't a big buff soldier he, he fell to. It was a little girl. Aren't you with him? No, I tell you. Scripture tells us that him and Jesus caught eye to eye. But after he saw Jesus... He looked over and there was John going, dude, did you just really do that? 
They had a relationship. They had a relationship. I've got a friend. He's seen God do miraculous things in my life. And he's also seen me done some really stupid things. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a John or Peter in my life. I'm reminded that it was Peter and John that were the first two men to find the empty tomb. What a relationship. In Acts 8.4, it tells us that Peter and John were sent to Samaria to evangelize. The Illinois church said, these two guys. Nobody, maybe nobody else wanted to go to Samaria. Maybe it was just Peter and John said, hey, well, go. Sign me up. Nonetheless, they had a special relationship. So it's not strange that these two are together going to the temple there at the ninth hour to pray. After the day of Pentecost had taken place, it says in Acts 2, 43, it says, many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Well, here you go. When God begins to move, it doesn't take long for God to move. And this is what Luke records as the first of those wonders and signs that were done through the apostles in Acts 3. So where we are, they're at the temple. It's the hour of prayer. Don't think that because Peter and John had put their faith in Jesus as Messiah, that it meant that they were no longer ministering as Jews. They were born again believers. They believed Jesus was the Messiah, the sent one, spoken by all the Old Testament prophets and proclaimed. And so they were still going up and looking for every opportunity to proclaim Christ at the hour of prayer. They would go up and they would worship. They were meeting up there. Now, the one thing that you can bet your bottom dollar on that the apostles didn't do or take part of at the Temple Mount was the sacrificing of the animals for atonement, for the remission of sin. You can bet your bottom dollar that's the only thing that the early church and the apostles didn't take part in there at the open. They wouldn't have done that. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He is my atonement. I'm saved by grace through faith. It's just Jesus. We don't expect Jews that come to faith in Christ to stop being Jews or Jewish, do we? They're actually fulfilled because Jesus fulfilled it. But they're up here. It's the ninth hour. The ninth hour. Around 3 p.m., the exact same time that the cloud grew dark, that there was an earthquake there on Calvary, Jerusalem shook as it went dark, and Jesus cried out, it is finished. The same hour. Now, for these apostles, for them to go up and pray, the ninth hour was probably the most important hour for them to go up and pray. They made it a priority to pray. Now the Jews here at this time had three specific times of prayer each day, every day. They had 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. And the 3 p.m. were considered evening prayers. So for this lame guy who has his cup out and he's begging, it's the end of the day. He's about ready to go home. He's already been out there begging for alms through, through the two previous times of prayer. You know, it could have been, it could have been a, a situation where he, he got enough. You know, I, it's hot out here. I've been out here all day begging for alms and, you know, pulled out his cell phone, called his Uber. Hey, can you come in? Pick me up. I think it says something about his heart. He's sticking it out through all three prayer times here at the Gate Beautiful. And it says something about prayer. These apostles are praying. God uses people who pray. You want great things to happen in your life or to be used by God in a powerful way? Start with praying. 
Start. Prayer opens doors. Prayer gives you opportunities. You'll end up walking right into things you, you never knew you, that, or, or that you would have never paid attention to if you hadn't spent time praying. Again, God uses people that make prayer a priority. And the Temple Mount would have been, and this hour of prayer would have been a wonderful time for these apostles to grow up there and look for every opportunity to preach Christ and to be witnesses for Christ. But on their way in, there's a certain man. A certain man could have been you, or it could have been me, or her, or her, or her. And I think about this for just a second. This certain man. How many times did Jesus go to the Temple Mount to pray? Now, it's not exactly recorded, but he went up quite a bit. And how many times would Jesus have walked through the gate beautiful, going up there at the hour of prayer, and walked right past this guy? You can, I, I, it's not, I would, I'm willing to guarantee you that Jesus walked by this guy and looked at him and said, your hour's coming. Your day's coming. Right? And I'm going to use these two over here that are kicking rocks right now. They're kicking rocks, but I'm going to use them. He's thinking. Right? That says something about God's timing. That, that says something about how God wants to use you. It says something about God's timing and how he's going to deliver and set you and I free in our time, in our situation. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, carried up there to the gate to beg. Again, we should all see ourselves as this man. We have all been spiritually lame from our mother's womb. From birth, we start out spiritually beggars and looking for people to carry us where we need to go. He's lame. It means his legs don't work. This man's never experienced what it means like to walk. He's been carried everywhere he's gone. Somebody has carried him. Again, we know that he's over 40 years of age because in Acts 4.22 it tells us. This man's only hope was to be a beggar his entire life. You know the person you meet at Fry's, at the grocery store, the drive through line? It's the same thing. So he gets there early that day. Before the first hour of prayer, the first time of prayer there, he shows up early. He gets his good spot, you know. We, we, see, we see those guys on the street corner on the freeway exit. You know, I've heard, I've heard stories of, of, of men and women fighting over specific spots. You know, that's my spot. That corner's my corner. Don't take my corner, man. That's where I beg and ask for alms, you know. You could bet this guy was carried there early, got his good spot, and, and the gate beautiful would have been the perfect place to ask for alms. You see, the, this gate was beautiful. I'll get to that in a second. But this would have been the entrance to church that made you look good. If you wanted people to see you come to the hour of prayer at noon or early in the morning at 3, you wanted to enter this gate. This is where you'd be seen, right? Right? All the pious people would have entered this gate. All the religious people, look at me, right? I'm going through the gate beautiful here today. I'm, gonna, I'm going, look at me, I'm going, to the, I'm going up to pray to the temple. Pious, and we you know pious people are the best givers, right? Because they're, they're given to be seen. Jesus dealt with that on the Temple Mount, didn't he? So if you're begging for alms, this is the perfect spot. This gate is described as being 75 foot tall and absolutely overcoated with Corinthian brass. It had two great big doors. Wolver believes that this, was, this uh, may have been the, the eastern gate of the Temple Mount, which led from the, uh, from the court of the Gentiles up into the, to the women's court. 
The way the temple was designed, you had the court of the Gentiles, then, then, then Jewish women can go in a little further, then the men can go a little further, and it keeps going on to the, eventually the high priest into the Holy of Holies. So it was, it was, you know, it was based like that. And so this would have been the main, main entrance uh, to the Temple Mount at this time, specifically for the hour of prayer. And I love this because everybody would have been entering this gate. Men, women, priests, Gentiles, so whosoever gospel. I love it. it. says something, doesn't it? Great place for them to go share their faith. Begging for alms. Think about this guy's heart. This is as good as it's going to get. I'll never do anything meaningful in my life. I'll never achieve anything great. I'll be carried everywhere I go. Everything I get, it's been a, I, I've had to beg for. But he will be transformed this day. He'll go from beggar to spiritual royalty. Boy, what a, what a, what a gospel. What good news. When you tell people, look, you need Jesus, I, I'm so sick and tired of a powerless gospel. Of a, of a gospel just void of spirit and power and authority and purpose. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. This guy went from a beggar to royalty. Royalty. When you receive Jesus Christ, you are, you are the son or daughter of the king of kings. The master of glory. The creator of the universe. But we don't preach it like that. It's all dumbed down into you can become a better person. Right? At best, he'll change your hairstyle. He's not going to take you from beggar to royalty. God's not interested in your dress code. He wants to teach you how to walk. Rise up. He wants to give your feet strength. Only Jesus can change your condition as well as your position. That's the gospel. Verses 4. So this guy, as they're approaching, I don't know if he saw them as vulnerable, <laughs> you know, spiritual, I don't know what, but this guy fixes his eyes on, on him and, and, and with Peter and John. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, they, he had looked, and then Peter, here in 4, fixes his eyes on this, this beggar. And, uh, and John and Peter said, he said, look at us. He wanted this man's undivided attention. And he gave him his attention. Again, he's expecting to receive something. Now, when we see a beggar, most of us are trying not to make eye contact. It's the truth. Don't look at him. Don't look. He'll come over to the car. I don't need my windshield washed. Go away. Go away. Go away. Go away. I don't got time for you. Right? The light's about to turn green. I don't have time to get my wallet out. <clears throat> I don't want to make eye contact. That wasn't Peter and John's problem. You're not going to share your faith without making eye contact. You're not going to do anybody any good without making eye contact. It's a relational gospel. You know that, right? Right? I know you think you're doing good, and you might do a little good, leaving tracks different places, trying to, trying to, you know, trying to share your faith in an ups, you know, without drawing any attention to yourself. You know, I'm going to do some small little thing that nobody can see me do with the hopes that somebody stumbles upon this track and doesn't throw it away. When was the last time you actually looked into somebody's eyes and seen their need, prayed for them, and told them, they, you need Jesus. Only Jesus can save you. As they fixed their eyes on this man, they did so with the heart of God. This guy had to believe that he was getting ready to have his cup filled. <laughs> but he had no idea. So 
So he gives him his attention, expecting to receive something. But he hears this, silver and gold I don't have. Peter and John, they didn't make this statement as if silver and gold, right, silver and gold would have been better. What tone of voice do you hear them saying this in? Well, I'm sorry, Kim. I'm sorry. You know, I, silver and gold I, I, I don't have. And I know that would probably be better. That's probably, you know, would probably be better in your situation. But, but I don't have that. But, but I'll tell you what. As a second, as a second you know, thing here, secondary thing, uh, let me just pray for you. How many of us are guilty of that? You've got the cart before the horse. The power is in prayer. The power is in the name of Jesus. It's not, there's no power in giving them some money. I mean, that's good, right? If good, God's leading you to do something of that nature, well, then do it for the glory of God. Do it with the heart of God, right? But, 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 but you know, what, what, what's that going to do for this guy? You're doing what everybody else has done as they walked by. And he's still lame. He's still crippled. He still can't walk. He can't jump up and praise and leap and jump around like a crazy man and give Jesus praise. He's still lame. Silver and gold I don't have. Silver and gold is not what this beggar needed. I believe that when they said silver and gold we do not have, They said it with as much faith, Peter and John, they said it with as much faith as they said, but what I do have, I give to you, rise up and walk. There was no change in their tone. Let me back up and say this to you. When Peter and John approached this man, they knew right then and there, before this man ever knew anything, that God was going to raise him up. He knew. He just knew. He just knew. He knew. There was no doubt. There was no doubt. He wasn't, he, you know, uh, and the enemy likes to come in there, right, and say, well, what if you say that and you actually pray that and the man doesn't rise up and walk or, or something of that nature? Let me tell you something about the Spirit of God and the power of Jesus' name and the authority that's in Jesus' name. It is greater than any other name. It is greater than any other voice that might enter your head in the process of praying for somebody. It's greater. And you're not going to heal anybody unless you believe that. And you speak as though you believe that. Now, I'm not, putting, I'm not saying there's power in your words, but I'm saying there's power in the name of Jesus. And that comes out of my mouth because it's already in my heart. Do you understand? I know God's going to move. These men, Peter and John, knew what would make this man whole and complete. It was Jesus. Turn with me to Luke 9. I want to show you something. Luke 9, 1 through 3. There was a time when Jesus called his 12 disciples together. And you can bet John and Peter were here and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Be a shame if that just ceased with the last apostle, wouldn't it? Do you think that the authority that's in Jesus' name ceased with the last apostle? That there's no authority in Jesus' name now that that the last apostle died, which was John? Well, you're a fool if you think that. You're a fool. The authority and power that's in Jesus' name still exists today. Look at what it says. After he'd given him power of authority, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now look at the order of that. Preaching the kingdom of God is the most priority. Healing somebody is healing them. So preaching the kingdom is going to, is going to transform their lives and their, their position. Healing them physically will change their situation, which both bring glory to God. 
And he said to them, in verse 3, Take nothing for your journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. He's almost making beggars of them, isn't he? And whatever house you enter, right? He's making beggars of them. I like that. But today, we've got the healer that says, I need a big 53 billion zillion dollar jet to do my healing. You know, it's like, wait a sec, hold back up. When you go out in the authority of Jesus' name, you go out in the authority of Jesus' name. Not in any other power, under any other steam. There's no marquee greater than the name of Jesus to draw attention to your ministry or to your work or the power. Because, you're, because he's going to say in 12, again, again he's going to say, do you really think that we did this? No, no, no. No, don't be, no. That was Jesus that just did that. And he'll go on and start preaching the same Jesus you crucified once again. So back to our passage. But what I do have, right? Rise up and walk. I give you, rise up and walk. He, he gave this lame man power in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. But a lot of people want to give people the power of Jesus, or the, they want to extend the power and the authority of Jesus that's in Jesus' name without them first receiving the, the transforming power of salvation. Now, I, notice something here. They weren't going to leave this undone. After, after we finish out the passage next week, do you think for one second this guy didn't turn his life and heart over to Jesus? Absolutely he did. Look at 7 through 10. And he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up. Guys, listen, I really love this because Peter is committed and is displaying a faith that would cause this man to take Peter's hand. This is the same faith that Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. He wrote this. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But listen, but manifestation, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, the same Spirit, he's going, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of those tongues. But listen, verse 11, this is the anchor, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. As he wills. Does anybody possess the gift of healing 24-7? Absolutely not. It moves like every other gift as God wills it to move in your life. Okay? That's what the Scripture's telling us. Back to Acts. But this guy, he, Peter, he lifts him up, takes him by the hand. I love that. I just the application of that. Peter is clearly led by the Spirit to heal this man. He's not motivated by his own compassion, but by God's compassion. It's God's, uh, it's, it, it, it's God's moment to heal this man. Immediately. His feet and his ankle bones receive strength. Some theologians believe that Luke, being a doctor, is using medical terms here in the actual original language 
when he's talking about that his that his immediately that his feet and his bones, right? His ankles just took on strength. He's looking at it like a doctor. Some believe that, that Luke might have uh, actually uh, uh, interviewed this man at one point or another. That Luke was familiar with this miracle. Rise up and walk. John 14, 12 through 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Do you believe that? And greater works than these he will do. Wow. Why? Because I go to my Father. Do you remember? Remember I taught you as we went through the Gospel of John? Jesus, it's better. It's better that Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father than on earth with us right now. We have the Spirit of God. We're not limitless. And whatever you ask in my name... That I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, he says, I'll do it. Do you want me not to read passages like that? Or or do you want me to excuse them away or or take some kind of authority or power away from the very word of God? Because I'm not going to do that. That's what it says. And Christians in other parts of the world believe that. They really believe that. I just don't think American Christians believe it. So anyway, this guy, he jumps up, leaping, stood, and he walked. <laughs> right? It's not like he... That's not the picture we're given here. Okay. He really didn't need Peter's hand to pull him up because it was the power of God. It wasn't Peter that was pulling him to the feet, to his feet. Hold me. Thanks, Peter. As he's going into the temple. It's not this description we have in Scripture. He jumped up. He leaped up. He stood up. God restored this man's legs. Healed him in that moment. His disformed legs and knees and ankles were as if they'd never been a problem. He was using legs that he, he never had to learn how to use, you know, like a baby, learning how to walk. He didn't, learn how to have to, he didn't have to learn how to walk. He was healed. And he walked like every other man. Well, no, he walked. He jumped and leaped as he went into the temple. He probably had better balance that day than anyone else that day in the Temple Mount. Interesting. Turns into a flash mob. Everybody everybody rushes as this man's leaping and praising God. That's going to get attention, is it not? I like the fact that he, he entered the temple with him. He didn't turn back. His first thing was, I gotta go tell the people that are gonna be picking me up at at, at, at you know at four forty five. You know, he he didn't think that. When God does something big in your life, what's your reaction? This man wasn't thinking, man, I wish I had more of my cup. He was thinking, man, I can make my own money now. I could do that thing I always dreamed about doing. Maybe his dream was to be a fisherman like Peter. Man, I wish I had my own fishing boat. I'd live down by Galilee and I'd wake up early in the morning and I'd load all my stuff and all my equipment in my boat and I'd go down there and I'd fish and, and, I'd, and then you know, I'd see somebody in need and I'd give them a fish. You know, Think about the things that went through his head as he lay there begging. It says here in the passage, everybody there at the Temple Mount knew that it was he, it was this man who had sat begging for alms. And Peter's given an opportunity to preach once again. This man held on to Peter and John. I like that too. The people all ran together to Solomon's porch. 
Solomon's porch was a portico of columns that ran the length of the east side of the outer court, which supports the gate beautiful and its location. But you got to stop. It wasn't that, that Peter and John took the time to, to, to look this guy in the eyes and to see his real need. Is, it, that's all crazy awesome. But Peter didn't get so caught up, and look what I just did. He didn't get so caught up in that that he missed the opportunity now to preach the word of God to these people. Let me tell you what just happened. When Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Peter wisely here takes advantage of the crowd. This open door, this opportunity that this healing provided. You know, Peter had healed in a similar way in Acts 9, 32. Real quickly. Now it came to pass, Acts 9, 32, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt here in Lydda. There he found a, a certain, look at, what does it say? Another certain man. <laughs> there he is, there's another Roger, another Steve, another Bill, another Dave, another John. Another certain man, right? Aeneas is his name. He had been paralyzed now for eight years. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. And then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. You think there was a sermon between all that that's not recorded? Uh huh. Paul does a similar healing in Acts 14, 8 through 18. We're not going to go there. But Peter and Paul both knew that saving faith did not come by seeing or hearing about miracles necessarily, but rather. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, correct? So that's why he says, so why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power, right? Under our own steam, our own godliness, we made this guy walk. We're not the answer to your problems. Jesus is, is what he's saying. He gives this, before he preaches an exhortation, he will give an explanation He's humble, I like that. Chuck Smith said, people, when this kind of stuff moves, they like to exalt the instrument. You gotta be careful, guard yourself. Don't exalt the instrument. The <clears throat> He's saying, why, do you, why, are you, why are you marveling at this? And Peter's point is that Jesus healed this man and Jesus can heal you. There's a certain man and there's a certain woman in every one of us. There's a certain man and there's a certain woman everywhere you go. And it's the religious leaders who are challenged. It's the pious religious people who are challenged and end up having these men thrown in jail for this very thing. Look, look, the world's not gonna get it, but the one who gets it, gets it. Are you with me? I've been to crusades and I, I've been to big, big evangelistic things and there's always some opposition out front. 
Have you ever seen that? Have you ever been to a Billy Graham crusade or a Harvest crusade or some big move of God and there's always some guy out there preaching against whatever's happening on the inside, trying to excuse or, or uh, what's happening here is not being of God and, and always coming against that. I remember the day I was saved, Easter Sunday, 1989. I've told you guys about it, but what I haven't told you was was as the sun was coming up and that band began to, the worship team began to play and, and there's thousands of people at, at Riverside Community College. They had uh, apartments and dorms all behind the stage that would overlook parts of the stadium and stuff. And people were flipping on their lights like, what the heck's going on out there? Shut up! Turn it off! You know, they're yelling out their windows and I thought, this is cooler. This is even cooler. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I felt that day like I was on the right side. I was in the right place. Those people that were turning on their blind, opening their blinds and yelling out their windows, looking, what the heck are these people doing? All these college students and stuff. They were hung over from the night before. Easter snuck, Resurrection Sunday just snuck up on them. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm in the right place. When God moves, sometimes it sneaks up on people. Most of the world don't get it. But those that get it, get it. There's a certain man and woman in each one of us. Every one of us needs to relate to this man who got this healing this day. Amen? Lord, thank you for your word this morning. It's transforming There's power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Right now, as we are paused, I want every one of you to think about someone who is lost and doesn't know Jesus. Think of somebody right now. Maybe think of someone that's sick and hurting, like really they need a touch. They're beggars, whether physically or spiritually. Think about them. Allow their name and their face to come up in your mind as we pray, Lord Jesus. You are mighty to save. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that has all authority in heaven and earth. God save. As Doug would say, God, turn loose the hound of heaven on their life, the Holy Spirit. Touch them. Transform them. Save them. Heal them. Sometimes there needs to be a a, a physical or a mental healing in order for someone to get saved. Many times there's a spiritual, or excuse me, a mental block that's keeping them from having eyes and and a heart that can see and hear, ears that can hear. Many times it's not our our feet or people's feet that are lame, It's, it's their ears are deaf. They've got a mental block. Jesus, take authority over that. Take authority over that. Bring healing for the person who has a a granddaughter or a son or daughter or a spouse right now in Jesus' name. You take authority over that. That thing that's keeping them from coming to you. That thing that's keeping them from receiving all that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you need prayer, Doug and I would like to invite you to come up. We want to pray for you. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, now's a great time. Let's stand and worship the Lord. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new 
How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must stand. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one new response. I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you So I throw up my hands Praise you again and again So that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I've nothing else fit for for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah oh come on my soul don't you get shy on me lift up your song You've got a lion inside of those arms. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those songs. Get up and praise the Lord. you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those songs get up and praise the Lord so I throw up my hands praise you again and again cause all that I have is a
except for our singing Remember, don't let anybody, don't let anything ever tell you as a child of God that you're a beggar. You're not a beggar. You're not a beggar. No matter where you find yourself, you're not a beggar. Yeah. And there's healing in Jesus' name, right? We've been face up in worship. Worship. We've been face down in God's word. Now let's step forward in his living. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. God bless you, church. Have a great week.